Okay guys, today we're doing point lighting. In the last uh, three videos, we covered the Fong reflection model, and to do that, we use the directional light. This light source is characterized by having only a direction and uh, no position, and uh, we usually use it for stuff like uh, the sun or the moon. Um, in most cases, one directional light is enough because, uh, well, there's only one sun, you know, unless of course you look Skywalker. Anyway, the directional light is good for outdoor scenes mainly, but for indoor scenes you would probably prefer to use a point light uh, to model stuff like uh, light bulbs or uh, table lamps, anything like that. The point light has two main uh, characteristics. Instead of a single direction vector, it has a position. This means that the light is spread out evenly in all directions, so we will need to calculate the direction vector for each pixel independently. And also, point lights are artificial, so their intensi intensity tends uh, to decrease as you move away from the light source. This phenomenon is called uh, light attenuation, and uh, we will need to calculate an attenuation factor in order to mimic the behavior of uh, point lights. In the real world, the light attenuation follows the inverse square law in physics that says that the decrease in light intensity equals to the inverse of the square of the distance between the light source and the object. In mathematical terms, we can write that the ratio between the light intensity at two different points equals to the square of the inverse ratio of their distance from the light source. For example, if we have two points, point 1 and uh, point 2, at a distance of x and uh, 2x respectively, then the intensity I1 at point 1 will be equal to 4 times the intensity at point 2. In other words, the intensity at point 2, which is at twice the distance than uh, point 1, will be a quarter of the intensity at point 1, which is obviously closer. If the distances are x and uh, 10x, then the intensity at the distant point will be 100th the intensity at the closer point, and uh, etc. The reason that this is correct comes from the equation that says that the surface area of a sphere is 4 times pi times the square of the radius. If the radius increases by a factor of 2, the surface area increases by a factor of 4. Without going too deeply into uh, physics here, this means that the same number of uh, photons, which is an elementary light particle, are distributed across a surface which is four times larger when the distance from the light source increases by a factor of two. Using this equation as is to calculate our light attenuation factor is not very convenient. Remember that in the real world, the light source is not a geometric point. It has some surface area which comes into play when we calculate its attenuation. But in the case of our point light, it actually is represented by a geometric point, which means that as we get closer to the light source, the intensity approaches infinity. We don't want to be dragged into uh, such uh, dark corners of uh, mathematics, so we use a simplified lighting equation where the light intensity of the point light is multiplied by an attenuation factor that will be calculated using the distance and a few other parameters that we can control. Now, in general, we expect the maximum of the attenuation factor to be uh, 1. Otherwise, we may end up increasing uh, the intensity of the light, which is probably not what you want. The attenuation factor is a fraction with uh, 1 in the numerator, and in the denominator, we have a sum of several terms. First, we have a constant attenuation term. Notice that if we set this term to be 1, we basically guarantee that the final attenuation factor will be no more than 1, because in general, all the three terms in this equation are expected to be positive. And indeed, most people set the constant attenuation term to be 1. The second attenuation term is called the linear attenuation because it is multiplied by the distance. As the distance increases, this part of the denominator increases linearly. And finally, we have the exponential attenuation term, which is multiplied by the distance, which is raised to the power of 2. As the distance increases, this part of the, of the denominator 
increases exponentially. Here we can see an example with two lights that are going up and down together in exactly the same speed. The one on the left has a linear attenuation of 0.2 and uh, no exponential attenuation, and the one on the right is the direct opposite. It has 0.2 exponential and uh, no linear attenuation. You can see that the difference is uh, somewhat uh, delicate. The one on the left with the linear attenuation is visible even when it goes all the way up, and the area which is lit experiences a linear decrease in the light intensity. The one on the right disappears when it is up and the decrease in the intensity is a bit sharper. It's not exactly linear. Anyway, as a 3D graphics developer, your job is to create the tools that will be used by level designers in your team to uh, tune the lighting for each scene. Uh, and if you are an indie developer, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun tuning this stuff yourself. So this is the classical attenuation function that you will find in uh, most resources, and this is what we're going to implement today. However, in this book, the 3D Math Primer for Graphics and uh, Game Development, I found an interesting alternative where you set two distance uh, thresholds. The closer thresholds and the more distant uh, thresholds. And the idea is that below the closer threshold, you're getting maximum intensity, so no attenuation whatsoever. Above the distant threshold, you get zero, and between them, you simply do linear interpolation, which you should be familiar with because we talked about it a few videos back. In this case, the intensity graph would look like that, okay? So the closer threshold here is two, and from there on, it starts uh, dropping until we get to seven, where the intensity is zero. So this is an alternative. I actually didn't try that myself. So if any of you guys want to try it out, it will be interesting to compare the results to the more common approach. Okay, cool. We've covered the calculation of the attenuation factor. So the second characteristic of the point light that we need to address in terms of the difference versus the directional light is the direction. So for every pixel, we need to recalculate the direction by taking the vector that goes from the pixel to the light source. This vector will be used to calculate the diffuse and the specular components of the lighting equation. Now, in the previous tutorial about specular lighting, I demonstrated an optimization where you transform the camera from world space to local space, and then you do the calculations in local space. So we want to continue with that approach here. We want to transform the position of the point light from uh, world to local space and then calculate the light direction vector in local space. Turns out that it doesn't matter whether this is a camera uh, or a light source, we just need to transform a position coordinate from world to local. So I'm not going to repeat the, the whole explanation here. Simply watch the previous video for that. And that's it. Now let's jump into the code. Damn, I hate disco. Let's begin with the fragment shader this time. I've done a bit of refactoring here since we now have two types of uh, light sources with uh, several uh, shared attributes. I created a base light structure with the color and the ambient and diffuse intensity. By the way, I'm using the diffuse intensity also for uh, specular lighting. GLSL doesn't support inheritance as in C++. So in the directional light, we have the base light as a member and uh, an additional vector for the direction. Here we can see the attenuation structure and the point light is composed of the base light, the attenuation and the position in local space. I've added a couple of uh, uniform variables. We have an array of uh, point light structures and the size of this array is uh, defined to be two here. This array can't be dynamic, so you need to set the maximum value according to the requirements of your game. We may use uh, fewer lights than the maximum, so we also have an integer uniform that we can update with the actual number of point, li point light sources. Most of the previous uh, contents of the main function move to a uh, calc light internal, which we will cover in a minute. Let's go down to the new main function and here we can see that we start by normalizing the normal vector. Remember 
that uh, normalized attributes that are interpolated by the rasterizer don't necessarily remain normalized. So you have to take care of it yourself. We do this normalization first because it's going to be used all over the place. Next, we calculate the directional light by calling calc directional light and uh, passing in the normal. In my implementation, I limit the number of directional lights to one because uh, I'm not Luke Skywalker. Next, we loop over the number of point lights and we accumulate their contribution that we get by calling calc point light with the current light index and the normal. Finally, we sample the color and multiply it by the sum of all light sources. Now let's see how calc point light is implemented. It takes the index of the light source and the normal as parameters. We start by calculating the light direction vector by subtracting the local position of the current pixel from the local position of the light source. Next, we calculate the distance from the light source to the pixel by calling length on the direction vector. This is an internal GLSL function, and I think that this is the first time that I've used it in this series. We also need to normalize the light direction for the remaining calculations, and we just need to make sure to do that after we get the distance from the original vector before it is changed. Next, we call calc light internal, which does the actual computation of the ambient diffuse and specular components. It needs the base light structure, the normalized light direction vector, and the normal, and it returns the color contribution from that light source. After that, we calculate the attenuation exactly as we saw previously by summing up the constant term, the product of the linear term and the distance, and the product of the exponential term and the distance raised to the power of 2. This function returns the color divided by the attenuation. Okay, so above this function we have calc directional light, which also calls calc light internal. It takes the base light structure and the direction vector from the single directional light that we have in this shader, and the, the normal of course was provided by the main function. The last function is calc light internal, which is exactly the same one from the previous tutorial. It simply uses its parameters instead of working directly on the uniform, so this makes it reusable. Other than that, there is nothing new here. Next up is the Lighting Technique class, and here we can see some changes that correspond to the fragment shader. The diffuse intensity was moved to the base light structure because it is shared by both the directional and the point light. Here we have the light attenuation structure. Notice that the constant term is initialized to 1 because this is what I most uh, commonly use. Next is the point light, which contains the world position of the light source and the attenuation. The user is expected to set the world position in the application code and then get the local position, which is a private variable. The local position will be calculated by calling calc local position with the world transformation of the object that is being rendered. We will see this function in a minute. Let's just go over the remaining changes in this file. We have a corresponding setting for the maximum number of point lights in the shader. We have a function to set the point lights. It takes in the number of light sources and the pointer to an array of point light structures. In the private section, we have the uniform location for the number of point lights and the array of point lights in the shader. Now let's jump to the CPP file of this class, and first we see the function that transforms the light source position from, lord, from world to local. As I said, the transformation of the light position from world to local is exactly the same as the corresponding transformation of the camera that we did for uh, specular lighting, so I move the code that does that to the world transform class. You can see that it takes the world position as a 3D vector and it generates the reverse translation and the reverse rotation from the attributes of the world transform class itself. It then combines the two transformations together and transforms the input vector. I won't go into more details here because all of this was covered in the previous video, so just uh, make sure to watch that if you have more questions. The rest of this file is simply to handle the new uniforms. Here we can see an example of getting the uniform locations of an array. For every element in the array, we need to query the location using this syntax. 
the name of the array and the index in square brackets. So I have this loop right here over the, over the array and I'm using SNPrintf in uh, capital letters because it is defined differently for uh, Windows and Linux. In Windows, it maps to underscore SNPrintf underscore S and in Linux, it is simply SNPrintf. For every attribute, in every element of the array, we generate a string using uh, SNPrintf and we query and save the results in the point light uh, location array. The changes in the application code are also very simple. I replace the directional light from the previous tutorial with an array of two point light sources. I initialize them with some color and attenuation, and in the render loop, we set them in the lighting technique. The only thing you need to remember is to call calc local position on every light source with the world transform of the object before you set the lights in the lighting technique. Otherwise, it will be uninitialized. If you run my code of the tutorial, you can play with the add and Z keys to adjust the linear attenuation. A increases and uh, Z decreases, and similarly with S and X for the exponential attenuation. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next tutorial.